been doing a lot of great work out here. And so what I was thinking when I was asked um, to present today that I would talk about something that might you might not be familiar with. Um, so I'm looking at a project as a case study for you all to introduce to you what we're doing in the field related to environmental justice. And at the end of the presentation, I'll bring it back as to why I think it's important for this, for this region. So, um, let's see. So what is environmental justice? Environmental justice is the fair treatment. I'm using the EPA's um, definition for now, but the, the state of California also has their own definition. So environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. This goal will be achieved when everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental health and hazards and equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. So this is where we um, get into the civil rights, where it's equal protection under the law, and the same degree of environmental protection. And this comes to play in CEQA and environmental planning in your communities. So what I did here is just wanted to give you kind of a, just a, just a run through, um, showing that the federal law has uh, come to fruition under President Bill Clinton in 1994. He signed Executive Order 12898, which kind of set about that definition that's even persisting on the EPA's website through this administration. Um, 1997 uh, policy and guidance document that incorporates environmental justice into the NEPA process. And then all federal agencies and policies are bound by this executive order. So every agency in the federal system has to comply with this environmental justice order. And then in California, we have also incorporated um, uh, the environmental justice laws, and we also cite EO 12898 in our environmental laws in California. So um, we have our code is 65040.12, we adopted in 2013, speaks directly to the environmental justice, and even as recent as uh, Senate Bill 1000 talks about environmental justice in our communities. Um, in 2016, we even have an expanded definition of environmental justice just this year. And um, also it's important to know that we talk about this in the general plan, our general plans have to incorporate environmental justice in them right now. Also, uh, as of 2012, we have uh, Senate Bill 535, which, which looks at disadvantaged communities. And the state has mapped these disadvantaged communities using Cal Enviro screen, and that falls under, you know, we, we look at these disadvantaged communities when we're looking at um, so, uh, AB 32, cap and trade funds, who's going to receive those funds, et cetera. So this, this disadvantaged communities in the Cal Enviro screen, it's really important for you to find out who is being, who are the disadvantaged people in the communities and whose voice do we need to hear from? Who are the people that we haven't really heard from? So. It's, it's kind of going to diversify how much input we receive in some of our um, the projects and different policies are, that are being enacted. So today's case study I thought would be interesting to share with you this case that was brought forth by, with the help of the Center for Biological Diversity. It's called the Youth for Environmental Justice, South Central Youth Leadership Coalition, along with the Center for Biological Diversity. And they sued the city of LA, the city of Los Angeles Department of City Planning, and the director of um, the city planning department. This case is still not wrapped up, but I think it's important 
for you to understand um, what can happen here. So sorry the font is small. There was quite a bit to share here. Also, my slide presentation will be available for you all after today's session. So what happened in this case was they started looking at this unequal protection. What was happening was in the Wilmington and South LA, there was oil wells being um, that had been established that were diesel powered drilling rigs that were adjacent to homes, apartments, a little league field, a high school for developmentally disabled youth, a clinic for HIV patients, and a playground. So we're looking at sensitive receptors, we're looking at um, young people who are developing, so we're having, you know, a, a major environmental impact due to oil drilling in downtown LA region. Um, and then they started citing hundreds, uh, citing these oil derricks hundreds of feet closer to sensitive areas than they did in the West LA and Wilshire areas. So here we have oil drill drilling in Los Angeles region, and we have a different process happening between people that are in the city proper and then some of the other in the other cities outside in the west side in the Wilshire area. And, it, and it's important to see, again, with the environmental justice, that in the Wilmington and South LA uh, areas, we have 70 to 90 percent of those individuals identify as Latino or Afri African American. And that information is dem that's demographic data available on the census data. And then uh, the West Side and Wilshire communities identify 40 to 80 percent of them self-identify as white. So you can already see that the um, the, the disparity in how we're treating uh, these individuals in Wilmington and South LA are already starting to emerge. So what they did in the, with the derricks in the Wilmington area is they put 30 feet sound walls on three sides of the derricks with acoustical blankets on the exterior of the rig floor. But in the west side, Wilshire neighborhood, they fully enclosed the derricks with an acoustically treated soundproof structure. So they managed the same type of project completely different, differently. Um, and then we have some other, some other things like we have a 6 to 12 feet wall around the drilling site in the Wilmington area and then in the west side of Wilshire area they use 12 to 25 feet walls around the drilling site. Um, then they added some extra environmentally, um, so, so they gave some mitigations to the west side area that they did not give to the, to the downtown LA. They gave them setbacks that were landscaped with lawn, ivy, or other green cover, planted with trees and shrubs to be maintained in a first class, attractive conditions at all times. That was in their, in their policy at the city of LA. So I, there's a lot of things cited in the, um, in the lawsuit, and I actually have the case um, attached here on the, on the screen. So what are the impacts from drilling activities? There's deterioration of air quality, as you all know, due to odor and quantifiable increases in air emissions. There's possible groundwater contamination, risk of fire from highly flammable material, long-term exposure to adjacent residents, of adjacent residents to um, potentially toxic air. We have noise impacts from construction, plus probably noise impacts from drilling. Increased local traffic, increased light and glare, and impacts of aesthetics and views from adjacent residential areas. So these are just some of the impacts that were noted in the case. Which generated these types of illnesses? Respiratory problems, asthma, pulmonary edema, and bronchitis. Neurological symptoms such as drowsiness, vertigo, and headaches. Cancer, skin and eye irritation, and the fact that children breathe at a higher rate they drink more water and consume more food, placing them at a higher risk. Now, in the case, they talk about bringing in the EPA to kind of do a, you know, an assessment of what's happening in the area. The EPA agents got 
sick <laughs> doing this doing the study going on on the site in the Wilmington area. So the EPA agents experienced neurological symptoms just doing a site inspection. Um, so this is kind of an important topic. Uh, so I have some, some of the sequel process, but what happens in this planning agency process is that we've had experience unequal access to decision making. So what happened? So, with their, so the city of LA has five, about 585 well sites. That's a lot of, of oil drilling. They were active and proposed. Um, so what their internal planning process did, which is why the director of the planning department was sued in this case, is because they decided that oil drilling is exempt from CEQA. CEQA and they gave it a categorical exemption. So this really becomes important because in as, as much as Dr. Tim is talking about the process, the CEQA process, and how it's important it is for us to engage in the public participation process and to, to be able to be, we're the experts of our immediate community. Many planners don't even live in the, in the cities that they work. So we're the experts of our community. And if we don't have a voice, if we don't, if we don't find out about the project, how can we, how can we speak up about it? And this is where the environmental justice issue comes in, because if if you're not being, if you're not, if you don't know this process exists, and if you're not being told that this process exists, how are you supposed to participate and protect your local environment? Um, so because they exempted these oil. Uh, Derricks and these, this whole process, there was no conditional use permit. There were no mitigations. Uh, there was no, um, there was no way to, to designate significant environmental impacts. There was no way to avoid them. The, the process was just eliminated completely. There was no public review. There was no responsible agency consultation or decision making. So South Coast, South Coast Air Quality Management District was not, was not informed. Um, but here's an interesting fact that, that I thought was interesting in the case, is they did require one EIR, one time, on a drilling site near a predominantly white neighborhood. And they, they base it on a threshold of changing technology to improve the environmental quality. So what they had was, um, diesel-powered uh, drill, uh, drilling rigs, and they were going to convert that to electric-powered uh, diesel, I mean, electric-powered oil rigs. So that change in their, in their technology triggered an EIR. So they were, and their EIR said that we were improving environmental quality. So I thought that was an interesting EIR that they, that they did. So needless to say, there was no decision-making body, and no notice of determination was filed with the state or clerk. So guess what? No one knew what was happening. So the importance, this is why I wanted to bring this case, because I know we talk a lot about um, the CEQA process, but if, if the project is not following the CEQA process, you won't know about it. You will not know about it. So it's good to keep an eye on things that are going on in your community and do some investigating and some sleuthing. So I kind of just highlighted a couple key things in the CEQA process that are important for us to follow so that we can, so that we can find out about some of these projects. But basically, I really wanted to highlight what was happening in Los Angeles. Why is this an important case out here in the desert? The CEQA process itself, when followed by the state's guidelines and the flowchart as in intended, it provides everyone the same protections and access. So the process is important, and it does follow, you know, the environmental justice path. If we if we followed CEQA to the letter of the law, we would have included most people in the community if if they learned about this process, which you're all here doing today. 
Um, categorical exemptions provide a lead agency a method of evading public and environmental scrutiny. They must be cited accurately by section and submitted to the state clearinghouse. So the law sets up our, our, our exemptions. They're either statutory or categorical. And we have to cite those categories very specifically in our notice of exemptions. As a planner, my experience with other planners in the office, if you don't know um, the process, if you were taught by on the, you know taught on the job, taught by someone who doesn't have um, an environmental planning degree or uh, has has training in CEQA, they may not see the importance, or that that information may not have been passed on to the planner. So I did work with planners who who kept telling me that projects were exempt. And I kept thinking, hmm, I don't think so. So I would take them back to my supervisor and show them. But these notice exemptions were still not even being filed with the state clearinghouse because these particular planners had no idea that process needed to be uh, followed through. So we, so we have, I personally have seen this inside of a planning agency. So when I read this case, it resonated with me because the planners might not know the actual policy and the process. So it really does come back to the planning director's um, oversight. He should be training his planners to make sure that they're following the, the CEQA process appropriately. Um, so here's the thing about rubber stamping approvals through a zoning administrator. I don't know if you, um, all the, I don't know if every city has a zoning administrator, but that's an administrative process, and as soon as you make a process administrative, they, they can tend to take that ministerial path where it's administrative instead of taking the environmental path, the, the CEQA process. So it gets kind of, that it blurs the line, so we should be paying attention to what type of projects the zoning administrator is approving, who is the zoning administrator, and are they kind of steering clear of the CEQA process if they're using the zoning administrator. Um, and then to review uh, the notice of exemptions for your area, you can go to the state clearinghouse. They use the NOE designation on the state clearinghouse website under the Office of Planning Research. But again, I'm telling you, just for your information, some planners don't file the NOEs. So, this gets back to government. You think, we think government's doing the job, but not everybody knows their job very well, and the process could be circumvented innocently or not. It depends on what's happening in those offices. Um, and then two, look at other approvals, determinations, and trends. So in this lawsuit, they had to really dig deep into the process of city planning office in Los Angeles. And they didn't really have a good process. They never, they didn't have a file at all about these drilling, these drilling rigs. They had no record of how they were managing these projects. So for us citizens, it's really hard to look at what's happening on the inside of a planning department. But the Center for Biological Diversity was very they, they were pretty sleuthy. They figured out a way to ask different questions here and there, so they were able to do their um, uh, get public records requests. But they had to be strategic in how they got those because it wasn't a very good record keeping system. And sometimes we don't keep records very well so that we can hide things. So, I mean, these things happen. I'm not saying we because it's not me, but <laughs> we know that people do this on purpose. So I want you to pay close attention to what's happening in these uh, planning departments. Um, so look at other approvals and determinations in your area. How are they keeping record? What is important in their process? And maybe one of the biggest things I learned going to uh, going to college, learning critical thinking, and going through Tim's classes and other classes is what are you not being told? What is missing? That's the biggest part of critical thinking is what is not being written 
in the EIRs or the environmental uh, in the, or the initial studies. Um, let's see, citing projects near disadvantaged communities versus highly desirable neighborhoods. You know, we have some, some topics out here uh, that have happened, the Eagle Mountain Landfill. There's some other projects. We are citing things in areas that we think we can hide or people don't know. Uh, so it's interesting. And speaking of hiding, I'll, t I'll tell you, I use a case study for my students that kind of resonate with them, and it's the Coachella Music Festival. So I decided that I was going to pull this EIR, and we were going to use it as as a way to engage, I, that I would use it as a way to engage them. Well, <clears throat> so we started looking um, for this Coachella Music Festival EIR, Stagecoach EIR. We're looking for it, we can't find it. So as I'm looking through the documents, I see the very small corner of a piece of paper, it says Golden Voice. So I said, hmm, let's take a look at this Golden Voice name. So then I started sleuthing for Golden Voice EIR. So the EIR was titled Golden Voice EIR for the city of Indio. And it's for the Coachella Stagecoach. So how many people do you think commented on that project? They probably didn't even know what it was. So they used a whole different name uh, to name the project. To me, as a way to stealth, this, I shouldn't say it like, I, I mean, I'm not trying to be negative, but I see it as a path to stealth the project to minimize public input. Perhaps that was not their intent, but I, I see it as such, personally. Um, we asked for a public records request to get the EIR. It took them about 35 days to get it to us after several requests. So it, and the way they now analyzed the EIR was interesting. They based it on um, traffic uh, patterns that are existing, but we know Coachella's been going on since what? the nine, late 90s, so in its infancy. So there, so instead of, instead of looking at all that data to show the progression of traffic, they, did, they didn't analyze it that way. So it's, it's interesting to see how, how we move through this SQL process. And then um, one of the things that I think is really important to speak on the, on the side of uh, being the planner, in the room at the time, is that if we, if we circumvent the SQL process, if we don't have people filing their projects and going through the EIR process, or going through the initial study and getting the technical studies, if we don't have people paying for conditional use permits, we're not going to have a staff ready to actually conduct the process the way it should be. And I think that it's important that we hold our planning departments accountable for making sure that they're analyzing, the, you know, identifying the projects, analyzing them according to CEQA, the way it's meant to be, so that we can actually have the fees paid because local governments are not, uh, they're not making a profit. They have to, they have to operate, um, they have to balance their spreadsheet. They have to be, it has to be, there's no profit to be made in government. So if you don't have enough people to do the project, or to, to, to do the work, maybe you're hiring consultants, maybe you're hiring people who are inexperienced. This is one that I use for my students, the layperson's guide to environmental impact documents. It's kind of easier for them to understand. It's not so complicated. And then this, uh, the oil drilling lawsuit case study. Uh, and as of, as of February, 2019, the case is still um, winding its way through the courts, and the oil companies filed a countersuit against the youth, and the judge, the appellate court, turned them down, so they didn't have a countersuit. So the, the case is still going through, but I think it really speaks, this case really speaks to the planning process, having equal access to the, to the information, and equal protection under the law so that you have a right to a clean and healthy environment, which comes back to Tim's uh, significant, mining, uh, significant findings 
findings of significant, mandatory findings of significance, the C, which said that everyone has a right to a healthy environment. And if you're not controlling that environment, it's an automatic, it, you know, you're not mitigating for the health of the community. It's an automatic EIR. So you can see why they might circumvent that process if they didn't have to. So that's my presentation. I hope I've got you some